Deerland Podcast. It's episode number 11. I'm your host, Mike Bowley. We're here at Bowley Farms. I've got the one and the only Tyler Sellins here with me. How are you, Tyler? I'm doing well. Yourself, Mike? I can't complain. So here we are. We're just trying to, to make it through this brutal winter. It just seems like it's uh, been going on and on and on. But the tides are turning. Springtime is here. I can almost smell it. And when springtime comes, that means a lot of things. But one thing that's always at the top of my mind is, is what are we going to do for food this year? Because as many people out there have learned, if you don't have some sort of a plan and think ahead a little bit, next thing you know, uh, you need to be planting like this week and you don't have everything ready. So uh, food plots, that's that's going to be the topic of conversation today. Uh, we, uh, we teased that a little bit uh, on our last episode. So um, that's what we're going to fill you in on today. We've got a lot of uh, food plot 101, I guess, is, is what we'll call this one, the intro to food plotting. Um, and as we stated last week, you know, we're no experts necessarily, but we've, uh, we've tried some things. Um, we've seen some things that work, some things that don't work. And, uh, you know, we're going to try to talk about stuff for everybody, you know, whether you have uh, a hand rake and a, a over-the-shoulder spreader or you have tractors and implements and everything you need over, uh, you know, a couple episodes, we're going to touch base on uh, all sorts of ways to do all sorts of food plots, big, small, different kind of varieties. So uh, we may not get all of it in in this one episode. No, no, this is going to be. uh, uh, I I hope people will take away something from uh, our trials and tribulations and uh, money spent. Uh, yep. I've had good money spent and I've had bad money spent too on food plots. So, so yeah, um, this will be food plotting one hundred and one. You know, and we'll have a we'll have a you know more advanced information you know coming up as well. So uh, we're going to try to start from the beginning and and work our way up from there. And I think if you talk to anybody that has done some food plotting, you know, um, some serious type of food plotting, anyone that. Uh, knows anything at all I think is going to tell you when you're going to first start talking about food plotting the first thing you need to say get a soil test yeah and I think uh to to back up a little bit there you you know the basics of food plots but but the probably the number one you know a lot of guys they they want to put a food plot in uh they're they're not they need to be a little more forward thinking don't you know if you want a brassica plot don't don't decide to put a brassica plot in on on uh, August fifteenth and not have any site prep. Right. Uh, you know, if you're wanting to get clover seeded, uh, you know, for a spring planting or a frost seeding, uh, don't think about that for May first. You know, and, and expect it to work. Uh, I think the number one, you know, probably where guys fail a lot of times and get aggravated with uh, with food plots and what I'll call as bad money spent, is they literally just get a little spot ready throw some seed on it. They don't know how big it was. They don't know what the fertility was. They don't know what the pH was. Uh, throw it out there, expect it to, to grow and, and look like the food plots you see on TV. But, uh, you know, I can guarantee you the food plots that you're seeing on TV, that, that whether it's the Drury's, Lakoski's, or whoever it is uh, doing food plots, Mike, you've had great looking food plots this year, and, and they've had a, you had more food there on, especially your small plot than, uh, I, I mean, almost, very too, oh, almost too much to the yeah. point where I mean the deer almost didn't want to go walk through it because it was so thick and so much of it there. But uh, you know, I mean, if you're skipping steps in food plots, uh, you're just spending bad money on on even doing it, in my opinion. Now, you know, you you have to keep in mind is that that some people have access to uh, you know more equipment, um, you know. So I, Winky calls in the poor man plot. Um, you know, so I think we want to touch on, on just simple steps for everybody that's going to benefit and, you know, not just whether it's the guy that, that puts a poor man plot in, you know, if you'll do a, a few extra things, I think will really pay off and, and look better in the end, um, and have better results. Uh, if you're on a big scale and you've got, you know, access to big equipment whether that's you know a 15 foot no-till drill that you know farmer bob down the road has or um 
you know, just any of that stuff. But um, so we'll we'll touch on some of that. But I think the the number one thing, you know, when when uh, thinking about doing a food plot, is just preparation of having a game plan well in advance of where you want the plot. Uh, what you want to have in the plot? Are you doing a, a brassica oat mix? Are you wanting the clover plot? Do you want a bean plot? Uh, that that I think is probably is is the the number one thing. I won't say the number one thing, but but it's a it's step one. Is you need to have a plan of what you're wanting to do, what you want in it, and where. Because depending on that time of the year, um, is going to depend and determine when you need to get that seeded, um, and what that site prep needs to look like. Um, you know, if, if you're, uh, you know, this time of the year, you're thinking, man, I've, I've got a, a bean plot that I had that I want to go to clover, a uh, great opportunity right now to get out frost seeded and more than likely get a good or a fairly good stand of, of clover this time of the year. But, um, just, just understanding that there's different times, uh, you know, because you're going to have some residue management if, if you're, uh, uh, you know, thinking of doing a brassica plot, um, you know, if you're thinking of doing that and it's July 31st and you've done nothing, uh, you know, you're you're going to have a challenge ahead of you to get that where where you need it to have a good looking plot. Um, I, I did that last year for, for a guy. Great. He's a great friend now. But, uh, you know, late in the year, we with he, he kind of said something about, well, let's what do you think about a food plot down here? And I'm like, well, we can get it done. But, um, you know, it was one of those that took some extra work on my end of it. But he ended up having just a phenomenal looking brassica plot last year. Just you know, big plants, big bulbs. Um, but we did what we had to, to get the site prepped to get the seed in there and get it to grow. Right. Um, but I think, you know, after the preparation, once you know where you want your plot to go and what you're wanting to put in it, I think the next step really that everybody needs to do, and is probably the most missed or skipped step that most people will do, um, is a soil sample. Without a doubt. And it's the best, 10 or 20 bucks that you will spend um, to really have good results. Uh, you know, if you get the soil sample, you're going to know what your fertility is, you know, where your pH is. If either one of those is off by a lot, which more than likely, if it's a, if it's an area that's never been planted, uh, just a fallow area, you know, your pH may not be right. Your fertility may not be great. So to have a good plot and have, you know, more tonnage of food there for the deer to eat, you need to have that had that soil sample so yeah. you know exactly what you need for uh you know your fertilizer you know what you need for your lime um the big thing or not the big thing but soil samples there's different places to go to get soil samples done um you know your local extension centers universities uh some of those will do them uh it, you know your crop production or nutrina um nutrient used, yeah. yeah nutrient used to be crop production um, but all your ag co-ops. Yeah, yeah ag co-ops, right. FS, a lot of those, they do soil sampling. If you go just collect the soil, take it out there, give it to them, they'll do a soil sample for you. You kind of want to know what you're going to put in it is going to determine what you need for uh, fertilizer, lime, those sorts of things. Different different food plots are going to require a little bit different uh, uh, fertility and, and pH in there just slightly. But, um you know, I mean, the the other thing, the simplest thing that I think a lot of people have found, um, Mike, you've done them. Um, if you don't want to take the time to take it out to your local co-op or have them come do it, um, you can get online. You can order some, you know, basically prepaid soil samples. Uh, White Tail Institute, they have some. I think they're roughly 15 bucks. Once in a while, you can catch them on sale lately. They've yeah, had. I think they got them on sale now for like 10-something. You buy four. You buy three, get buy one Buy three, get one so. free, yep. Um, it, and I it, bought some at our local Game Masters, a local sporting goods store. They had some as well. I mean, so you can find them all sorts of different places. Um, and so that, that's something else. And before we get too far out of there, I mean, we were talking about planning. And you need to plan for now, but you also need to be thinking down the road some other ideas that you want to have because you can't plant brassicas in the same plot, you know, five or six years in a row. I mean, you you know, with disease and bugs and stuff, you've got to, you know, you've got to uh, – to rotate them every couple couple years so you know that's something else in the planning stages throughout the winter the off season you know figure out what it is you'd like to do um your dreams your goals i guess and then once you get your soil sample you see what you have to work with and then figure out how you can make that a reality but uh, that's something that i went through 
trying to lay out my five acres of food plots. You know, it was the first time, and I knew I wanted some diversity. And I didn't want to just go out and just plant a chunk here and a chunk there. I wanted to try to have some strategy into it as far as, you know, making some clover paths through the, the bean plots and, you know, placing them in certain areas. So um, planning is, is a good thing. You don't – the less – off the cuff stuff you can do the better you're going to be because you're going to spend less you know waste less money and waste less time so yeah i mean what have a have a plan of what you want to plant um that is targeted for different time you know is it a is it a hunting plot is that your purpose on it or is your purpose just to feed the deer to give to keep them on your property i mean there there's different things yeah, to you think have about. a kill plot and a you know a destination plot or you know um yeah, I mean, and, and that's the other thing is too is is uh, you know when we talk about planning is is it's more than just what do you want in it, and what's your purpose in it, but it's also is the location in it too because you don't want to have you know if the best best place to hunt your on your farm to hunt is in you know a half mile back and down this one path and there's a nice clearing in the middle of this path you don't want to put a food plot right, right there that you've got to go in and in and out of all the time because you're you're kind of defeating the purpose you're attracting deer to that area and then you're blowing them in and out you know, consistently if that's your entry and exit. So a lot of it is looking at, uh, you know, the layout, uh, food plot architecture too. I yep. mean, that that's, you've got to, if you've got access in and access out, uh, you know, hunt the edge of it, um, that you can slip in and out of the, out of that food plot and allows you to hunt that more, more often, um, with less pressure. Yeah. You bump, you bump some deer two or three times and they're, you know, at first, maybe come in right at last light then the second time you bump them maybe the next time they're coming in you know it's dark and then you know you may get to the point where they just say to heck with it and they just don't even come to it because you know they're always getting bumped you know smelling that you know the human scent in there and so getting in and out of the food plots uh, or getting around them to wherever it is that you're going you got to keep that into mind you know is because it's going to draw deer mm -hmm. i mean that's what they're there for so um don't uh don't cut off your nose to spite your face type of thing, you know. So so think big picture when you're you're planning these things. So in all of you know, for examples, I had a plot uh, that I put in last year uh, on my dad's farm, and it was what it was is he put a building up, and we, we'd done some clearing and this and that, and had a little area back there. It's it's probably a half three quarters of an acre, and brush piles in there, and and uh, you know I told dad I said let's I'm gonna get the skid loader, and I said let's go over there and let's clean all those piles out. Let's pull it out. Let's open it up. Um, time we're done, we're probably we're probably three quarters of an acre of a food plot there. But my purpose in that plot was not to hunt that plot. It was just a plot just to let the deer come, get them close. When you're at the back of our building, literally the plot is less than 50 yards off the back of the building. Now, the next thing I did was I, I knowing that I'm attracting deer up to there that you can see from the road is I put a plot screen in there. Plot screen went in. I mean, the deer were comfortable. They'd come in and eat in the daylight. Um, you know, I think Dad wound up putting a, a, a ground blind on it, and he might have hunted that thing twice. It was off to the side of it, but, you know, had that uh, that target buck heavy. Yep. I mean, he was – I had multiple daylight photos of that deer in that plot on numerous occasions. Dad had him at 75 yards one night with the, uh, with crossbow during bow season. Um, but he was in and out of that plot, I mean, nearly daily. It was – like if it wasn't, if it wasn't daylight, it was just after day or dark, um, and daylight, um, morning and evening. But he was through that plot all the time. Um, but the purpose of that plot was not for me to hunt it. But I was able to access stand locations, not having to go by that plot too. Yep. So that that's a lot of it is is knowing where you're putting your plot, what your purpose is in it. Um, just you know, be thoughtful and you know sometimes there's great places that you could put a plot. It'll look great. You might have deer in it, but if it's going to be you know more negative impact on your farm than it is positive that's probably not the best decision to do so yep so that's kind of more of the the planning thing and uh you know and it can take a long time i mean you know with my property we got this idea to you know take it out of commercial production go to crp and and food plots and you know that took an extra year than what we thought but i needed all the time that i could because you know i really spent a lot of time thinking about what i wanted how I wanted to, you know, where I wanted to put it at, how I was going to rotate things. And um, so I'm glad that I, I took the time uh, because this year, you know, we're going to make a couple small tweaks that, you know, we'll talk about, you know, in our maybe our advanced uh, episode as to why we're, we're doing what we're doing this year. But um, the soil test, that was the first thing that I did. And I took, 
how many soil tests did I do last year? Four, I think, total, um, four different areas. And I've got some of the results right here in front of me from two different plots. And this is just kind of what I want to talk to you about is, you know, one of them we did uh, with machinery and, you know, stuff, uh, tractors and discs and uh, tillers and stuff. But another one was mainly kind of a, a poor man's plot, the one in the power lines. It had been overgrown. Um, nothing had been there ever other than, you know, trees and grass and stuff and got it cleared up. But then I just had uh, just bare dirt. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be great, but I wanted to see what I had to work with and figure out what I needed to do to hopefully at some point uh, get it there. And so that plot and then one just, uh, what's the small field, 100 yards away, 150 yards away, you know, that's not even that, really. I mean, if you go straight, uh, straight, corner to straight corner. east, well, east and west. If well, I, I guess you've got the. I'm thinking the north one that you didn't do that we just spread right. the oats and traded kale and stuff yeah. on this year. But but that I south mean, one, I mean, uh, the northwest corner to the southeast. There's corner. probably 75 yards yeah. between them. So they're they're pretty darn close to one another. Now the the what we call the small field where I I killed uh, that 160 and a couple does at this year um, has been in commercial production for you know decades uh, until we took it out and uh, did CRP and this food plot system um, so it had been maintained and luckily you know the the tenant that had always farmed it was very good about you know keeping up on the maintenance of the field and um, so I did that soil test and I got those results back and it come back with a pH of 6.8. Um, which is awfully darn good. I mean, you're looking for that 6.5 to 7. I mean, 7 would be perfect, um, but 6.8 is pretty darn good. Um, so I, one of the, the forages that I had thought about putting in there was an Imperial Whitetail Clover from Whitetail Institute, which is one of those seeds that I do believe is um, heads and shoulders above, you know, getting just a, a, a bulk, been clover mixture you know a, a different red clover white clover whatever it may be this blend is, is has been shown to be very good forage um, establishes very well so uh, the results come back for it for um, a new field you know one that had never been planted there wasn't already an establishment of clover there uh, per acre 15 pounds of nitrogen and 80 pounds of of potash or potassium um, no phosphorus was needed, no lime was needed. So you go 75 yards to the southeast in this power line plot and where had nothing had been done. And I had uh, the, same, uh, the same soil test done there and it come back with a pH of 5.6, which is still a little better than I thought it would be, but it's awfully low um, for what I needed it to be. Um, the organic matter in the, the power lines was 4.1% and it's 2.8 in the small field. So it had a lot more organic matter in it. And when we talk about the, the differences in the two plots too, is there, there are plots that are very close to one another. One was ag production. Yep. One was overgrown, just brush. And the, the year one, uh, differences in what each plot looked like. Just unbelievable. Night and day difference. But that's the difference between having things done. Uh, you know, kind of behind the eight ball a little bit on the one in the in the power lines because it was after getting everything else done of trying to get that one. Well, I still the same day I planted brassicas in both those plots the same day. Um, so we granted we already had some other stuff planted into the small field. We had some pure attraction, I think, uh, already in there that was slow coming about because we were in the middle of a drought. Uh, so we decided to throw some more brassicas on there just in case. So I did that the same day. So the establishment, the, the recommendations for establishment of the Imperial Clover in the power lines that uh, had not been anything was 15 pounds of nitrogen, 60 pounds of phosphorus, and 120 pounds of potash. So you got 15,080 and 156120. Um, so uh, obviously it needed a lot of uh, phosphorus and, you know, 150% more potash and the other thing to remember too is is you know you can only put so much fertilizer down at one time um the ground can only absorb so much you know at any given mm -hmm. time and the cec is kind of that factor i had heard that 
whatever your CEC number is, take that times 10, and that's as many pounds per acre of fertilizer that you can put down that the ground will actually absorb. So with this here, it's 144 pounds, um, and, you know, the recommendation is actually 195 pounds. So um, we got a little bit more uh, fertilizer per acre than maybe what the ground could actually absorb. But it's also calling for 5,000 pounds per acre of lime. Two and a half tons of uh, yeah, and it's about four tenths of an acre, so it needs that four tenths needs two thousand pounds of lime. So, um, but again, I planted brassicas um, both from Whitetail Institute. It was some stuff that I had had that I hadn't got planted yet, um, and in the small field that was amended correctly, just phenomenal growth, phenomenal foliage, phenomenal bulb production, um, just beautiful, just what you would draw it up to be in the Power lines, not so much. Um, it did make some bulbs about the size of a golf ball, hit and miss. Um, we even seeded in some, you know, some green, some triticale and oats and stuff in there uh, first of September or so, and they did okay, but none of it did great. I mean, it looked green in there uh, middle of September and September after some rains, but uh, it know. didn't grow anything like what the small no, field no. did. And, and again, that just goes to show you how important it is to get your soil tested and then get it amended. Because if the pH isn't right, you can throw all of the fertilizer you want on it, but it's not going to be able to utilize it to its full capacity. So you're wasting money essentially in fertilizer. Um, and that's the other thing too. Let's, let's back that's up. That's bad money spent by yeah. not doing, following the proper steps proper steps and all of this can be applied to any food plot regardless of what the size is and really regardless of what what uh what you have for equipment if you have something as simple as uh you know when we're, when we're talking about just uh fertilizer spreading lime spreading if if you've got something just as small as a shoulder spreader you can get this stuff done it'll be a lot um, of work a it's gonna time, be a lot of work yes it but can be done if you want good food plots good results uh, that's palatable for the deer, and they're going to want to, you know, if it's just a long-term plot location, um, you know, and, and we do the soil sample. So once we've got the soil sample, we say, hey, this is what we need for fertilizer. Now, can you go to your local farm store, farm and home, farm king, farm and fleet, wherever that is, uh, you can go there, you can buy a bag fertilizer. But more than likely, that bag fertilizer is not going to be the specifications no, of what you need. No, guaranteed it's not. So that is, one, is the simplest way to do it, but you're not going to get the results that you need doing it that way. My recommendation to anybody uh, or to everybody is to go to your local ag co-op, walk in with your soil sample, tell them what you have, tell them what you need. They will get you the fertilizer that you need, regardless of how much of it is. Yep. Whether you need... 100 pounds, 1,000 pounds, or 10,000 pounds, they can get it for you. Uh, they may not be thrilled about getting you 100 pounds of fertilizer, but um, keep, keep in mind that if you have a tote, um, if you've got barrels, uh, depending on how much you need in, in the application of it, uh, you know, they can mix it up to exactly the specifications of what you need. Say I need, you know, X amount of nitrogen and, and potash and that's it or whatever it is. Tell them what you need hand them the soil sample they're going to look at it they can figure it and tell you what you need um based on what they have too so keep in mind if you're putting like urea on if it's not treated depends on what time of year it is well yeah it depends on what they're going to have but you're going to have to be uh pay attention to what they're selling you too and they'll read about it a little bit before you go throw it out there because if you just take urea and you throw it out and it sits there in the sun it's gone a couple of days it's gone uh, you know, I know I've heard of people putting urea on of just literally going out and it starts raining and they go out and start putting it on just so they know it yep. goes in. Uh, if you incorporate it into the soil, it's a little, a little different there. But, um, so, so what I have done, and again, I have no farming background. I have no farming connections, anything like that. Uh, I did get lucky that, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a guy from my hometown, uh, works at, uh, what was crop production services, now nutrient ag solutions. So I did kind of have a, a, a connection there but i just told him said hey this is what i'm looking to do i understand i'm a i'm a small fish in a big pond here you know uh, you're not going to make a ton of money off me like you do you know a lot of these big customers that are farmers and doing hundreds or thousands of acres and they were so good to work with i went in there with also telling them hey i don't expect you to put me at the top of a priority list right here um i can be a little patient i mean i understand 
just bi- good business. I mean, um, I don't expect that. So I tried to work with them, and they took care of me so well. Um, Ryan Weeks was fantastic explaining things to me. Also, you know, getting things set up, um, getting me the right fertilizer mixtures when I did my CRP, getting me the right uh, seed mixtures and stuff like that. And again, I'm just a no-name guy that has, you know, five acres of food plots that I'm trying to do and go into my local co-op that – services hundreds of thousands of acres or you know uh, big clients and and i still got the service that i needed and you know and here's the thing you go buy a bag of triple 13 and so you know let's say like uh you know one of these uh, you're getting an awful lot of filler on triple yeah 13. so i right here i've bag. got 15 zero 80 you know so all of the potassium that's in there is uh or the phosphorus that's in that triple 13 i don't need any of it so i'm paying for all of it and i don't need it um, and then to get to the 80 pounds of um, potassium, the the K, so the last 13, I'm going to have to get a ton more. Then I'm putting way more nitrogen on than I need. Um, so you're just, it's not very efficient cost-wise. And, and you're paying more. I mean, a 50-pound bag of fertilizer at, you know, uh, the farm store is going to be a lot more than it's going to be at your co-op because, you know, they're buying it wholesale and retail and there's markup and packaging and difference between buying bulk and prepackaged. So. And you've got to understand, too, is what that trip you know if you're buying triple 13 at the at the store what you're actually getting for fertilizer and how many pounds of actual fertilizer are yeah, in that, that 50 pound bag you're getting six and a half pounds of each in p and k so and if you go out and you buy you know from out here they're going to have different you know different fertilizers gonna be different rates uh usually at a higher percentage of uh you know actually what you're looking for per plus filler pounds. i guess yeah i mean there's always a little bit of that but um you know, so I, and I think regardless of how many pounds you need, how big your plot is, um, you know, if you're doing a poor man plot and you, if you have a quarter acre that needs, you know, 25 pounds of fertilizer or 100 pounds of fertilizer, you can literally take five gallon buckets out there. You know, they can weigh it out, mix it up. There you go. You know, maybe you've got four, five, five gallon buckets, and and that's the fertilizer you need. I mean, they're they're going to help you with it. Yep. That's, you know, the simplest way. And a lot of this is planning too, knowing when you want to put it on. So if that's all you, you know, if you've got a little bit of fertilizer like that, you can go out there with a shoulder spread or put it on. Yep. Um, and I think we had talked to another guy one night. We were out to supper or something, ran into him, and he works the same place. And we were talking about kind of the food plotters and, you know, their business needs. And um, Jeff Daddle. Yeah. yeah. He used to work over at uh, Green, Green Valley, Valley Seed. And, and now he's at Nutrien. And, yep. you know, he said he, he loves to work with, you know, the food plotters and stuff. <laughs> I mean, for various reasons. But, you know, it's good business because – you know, there's no one. No one is going to doubt. It's a the, niche. It's the money a, that we spend is crazy sometimes on equipment and gear and tags and you know our vacation time. I mean, we get we get pretty serious. So um, we're not going to argue. If I call them up and say, "Hey, I need this, this, and this," and they say, "Well, it's 150 bucks." All right. Well, there are some you know maybe farmers out there that you know everything's too they're expensive. Running a business. And, yes, they're running a business. I it's mean, it's their so livelihood. This is a, a hobby for us. So, um, and that's one of those things. A buddy of mine used to own a towing business and, you know, he would always say, man, people would be so mad. The money they would have to pay, you know, 150 bucks to, be, to get their car pulled out of a ditch in the middle of the winter time. They complain about it. But then again, they don't mind hiring me as a DJ to DJ a 40th birthday party and pay me $400 because, that's something they want to do. They don't have to do it. It's it's a want, so they don't mind spending the money there. Um, so that's kind of like with farmers; they have to spend that money. Um, it's their livelihood; it's their bottom line. And you know, with us food plotters, I mean, it's more of a hobby, and we know it's going to come with some costs, and um, so we don't really complain much about uh, what the input costs are because we know that going into it. Yeah, and and I think regardless of how big your how many acres, big or small, you're going to do in food plots. When you get down to it, you're going to have a lot more money in a food plot doing it the right way than you are just scratching some dirt and throwing Period. some seed down. But you're going to have, you know, tenfold the results. But, you, you know, when you go back to the fertilizer thing, so we've done, you know, the preparation. We've done the soil sample. We know what we need for fertilizer. You can get the fertilizer if you need, uh, you know, I think, didn't you buy a, a tote or something like that? Of, um, what was it you were telling me you were looking at buying? To, oh, get, to get your fertilizer. Yeah, there it was a, a water tank, uh, just a like a. They're a like a galvanized, tank. like a galvanized frame on the outside and a poly tank on the inside, like a transfer tank. Is that what? Well, no, it was just like a like a seventy five gallon stock tank. Just a okay, gotcha. Uh, and and Ryan Weeks had told me that's kind of what he uses for certain things. I didn't do it. I ended up just using a fifty five gallon drum that you got me. 
the only downside to that is is the where the fertilizer drops out of the overhead thing it's the hole of the barrel's just a little bit too small so we got to drop it into like a big loader bucket and then shovel it into the barrel mm-hmm. um but they don't complain now every now and again you know you'll get a guy that you know he maybe he's had a long week or something and um, but usually ryan and i will go out there with them and you know i'll offer to help shovel and it doesn't take that long just a couple minutes but what i love about that is i put that barrel in the back of my truck make sure it ain't going anywhere. And then when I get home, I can back my truck up and then I back my fertilizer spreader up and I just tilt that barrel on its side and I can just by myself in just 30 seconds, I can dump it from that barrel into my, you know, my yeah. three point fertilizer spreader. So, so, but even if I didn't, if I just had an over the shoulder spreader, you know, and I had to get a couple hundred pounds, you just get you a shovel or whatever and you just load it into your crank spreader and there you put go. Put it in five gallon buckets, put it in a 55 gallon drum, you know, just find something you can haul up bulk. Go there. They will load it up for you, yep. help you get it loaded, uh, and get you what you need to get the right amount of fertilizer on 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 your food plot. And just call when, ahead. That's the other thing, yeah. too. You know, don't just show up. Let them know, hey, this is kind of what I've got, um, especially depending on what time of year it is. If they're really busy with farming, you know, you might have to wait a little while. So, luckily, I try to plan mine and kind of when they have some downtimes. And I got lucky enough with my big fertilizer job this year that uh, they had a rain day, but it was dry enough where I was that – they just come out and spread it for me. I think it cost me like 15 bucks or something to have them come out yeah. and spread it. So, now, I don't think that'll be an option every year, but I took advantage of it this year. Access to plots is another thing to consider. Um, with what you, I've helped some guys last year, too, of um, you know going back and trimming some lanes and things like that uh, just to get equipment in there. Um, you know, So we've talked about you can go to your local co-op and you can pick the fertilizer up yourself in, in buckets or barrels or totes or whatever it is. Uh, the other option, if you have access to um, a tractor that has PTO and hydraulics, uh, you can rent their buggy. Mm-hmm. Tell them how many acres you or how many pounds per acre you're wanting to put on of what's in that. Um, you know, if you need 1,500 pounds of fertilizer, they'll dump it in a buggy and they'll set it where it needs to be for you. They're used to setting those things. More than likely, if I did it, I'd have not enough on it or yeah. way too much and I'd run out or uh, have to do it three times. But you can rent the buggies. I think a lot of times they're a couple bucks an acre or something like cheap. that. It's cheap. cheap. They'll they'll mix it up, load it in, park it there. You can pick it up when you need to. Yeah. Bring your pickup truck, hook they, it onto your pickup they'll truck. They'll even deliver it to you as well. Yeah. So And then you can go around and do it where you need to. Uh, the other option is if you have access, so you know doing the buggy thing, if you've got a trail through your property uh, that you can drive your tractor and their buggy back into and get back in there and spread it, great. If you've got a big open roadway that the combines used to going down and the big four-wheel drive tractors and it's, it's wide enough and cleared out enough, and if your co-op's willing to do it, probably depending on how many acres you're doing, uh, you like you did. You can hire them, pay them a few bucks an acre. It's it's in the whole scheme of things. You don't have to touch a thing. They get the fertilizer on. They'll drive their, uh, you know, their fertilizer spreaders over and and spread it for you, and you're done. Yep. Um, so I, it's getting the fertilizer on is very doable, regardless of what you have. Shoulder spreader to your own tractor to hire them to do it. But there's a lot of different options, and a lot of this is going to be you know, here's my piece of advice. You know, you hear a lot of people, oh, I don't have that equipment. I can't do that. Well, if you don't have access to equipment um, of any sorts or whatever, don't go out and try to put in two, three, four acres of food plots because it's just not feasible to do it with hand tools. Um, So if, you know, if you're in a position where, you know, I was at that point one time where I didn't have anything, Um, you know, a rake and a a shoulder spreader that I used in the yard, um, just little bitty things, you better be starting off about quarter acre plots or so and, uh, and working on those. Um, So, if you're going to be getting into these bigger ones, there's plenty of options. There's ATV implements. Um, you know, most people these days have a four wheeler or a side by side of some sorts. Mm-hmm. I've even pe- seen people use their pickup truck to pull these things around, you know, um, any type of tow behind equipment. Um, but the one thing before we, we forget about these soil tests, the, the other big part of a soil test is your lime. And that's the one thing that can be a little trickier as far as the application goes. Uh, agriculture lime is a very dense product. Um, it doesn't spread real easy. It cakes up, you know, so if you go to put it through, a, you know, a spreader, a PTO spreader or something, it's some people have said they've done it, but I've seen I've tried it. 20 <laughs> bad stories to one that says it works. So. I've got the bad story. I tried it one time it, and it just it was it was horrible. Yeah, I mean, because it just packs into a cone. 
uh, you've got to fight it all the way going out. Yeah. Um, so you, that's that's not an option, not the, a viable. The, option. the lime, I th- I really think there there's a couple different options. Is your ag lime, uh, you know, once again, if you've got access, that big equipment can get back there, and you can hire your local co-op to come in and spread it. Simplest way to do it: make a couple phone calls. If they know where it's at, tell them how much you need. Uh, you know, that's not something, especially in the wintertime, if you say, hey, get to it when you can get to it, um, that's great. Um, if you've got a drop spreader, um, I think you've you, – you Yeah, there's – Agrifab a, has one. It's just like a little pull-behind-your-lawnmower thing. I think it holds 275 pounds or something, um, and you just hook it up and pull it, and it just – it's an actual drop spreader. just drops right out of the bottom of it. That's an option as well. Um, they, it's going to take you a while to get – a ton of lime on something, yeah. but you can do it. It can be done. Um, the the other thing, I mean, you know, I mean, you were, we were talking about this before we started. Is you know, you, I mean, you can even go to the uh, go to the rock quarry and buy the lime. Yep. Uh, they'll load it in the back of your pickup on your trailer, whatever you need to do. If you've got to go out there and literally just take shovels and and spread it evenly, but know how much you're putting on to. So, uh, you know, lime is a dense product. So what, what looks like a you know, a small pile of lime weighs a lot more than what you realize. So yeah. spread it accordingly across your plot. You can do it in various low, ways. Low wind days as well. You don't want to be doing it into a headwind, and, you know, you'll be eating a lot of the lime. So. Yeah, if the only thing that you have access to for lime, uh, as far as an application goes, is a shoulder spreader or a PTO three-point spreader. It's not going to work. Ag lime is not going to work. Your other option to use is going to be pelletized lime. However, yep. pelletized lime doesn't typically last as long as what your ag lime is going to have. It's going to have more of a uh, lasting effect on the soil than what your pelletized will. And when you you get your soil test back, it's going to tell you, you know, how many pounds per acre. And that is for agriculture lime. That's not for pelletized lime. There are conversion scales and stuff to figure out, you know, what does that translate to. Uh, and then your pelletized lime is just not going to give you the long-term effects that ag lime will. You know, you get an application of ag lime in, and it's liable to last you four, five, six years before, you know, you may have to more add any more. Yeah, yeah and, and longer sometimes, too. Uh, whereas ag or pell lime, it's going to be a essentially about an every year thing, um, a decent amount. So you're going to be spending some money, but it is something that can be done. Um, back to the ag lime thing, this is something that I can't speak to from experience, but I have seen other people do it and it has worked is two different things. One, what they will do is they will put it on the back of a trailer and they will drive around the plot and w- one guy or two guys will be in the back with just shovels and just shoveling it off as you go and you know drive around your food plot. Another one that seems to be uh, somewhat popular is do you stand back there with a high-powered leaf blower just, and, you, and you leaf blower it off? And people say it does work. Is it the easiest or the most efficient? No, but it does work. So this power line plot that we're talking about, I have to get some lime added to it. Um, my big fields, uh, they're fine right now, and I've got a plan down the road. Um, you know, when the neighbor's farm is getting done, you know, when they're getting lime, I'm going to have them come over and do mine at the same time. But – I'm not going to have them come out to do 2,000 pounds on this four-tenths of an acre. I mean, it, they're not going to do it, and I wouldn't expect them to do it. So I'm going to have to go to Miller's and get a, a ton of lime on my trailer and then figure out what I'm going to do. Um, and granted, it's not that big. I think a couple guys, you know, with a shovel or a blower, I want to try the leaf blower thing just because I'm curious. As long as it's dry, I mean, it would yep. – Theoretically, it would work. So, so that's some other options. And again, sometimes you got to get creative. And then sometimes at the end of the day, it just breaks down to uh, um, sweat equity. You know, I mean, just getting out there and doing it. And keep in mind is if you're putting ag lime on, it's not. If you put it on this fall, don't go take a soil sample this spring and expect it to be where it needs to be. It does take time to change the pH in the soil. So, um, good year. I mean, yeah. Don't don't put it on and don't put it on and and uh, get all done and go take a soil sample and, and expect your pH to be where it needs to be. Yeah. I mean, that's um, – And some guys will put some Pell Lime on for this year with the Ag Lime as well and get some of the benefits from the Pell Lime because the Pell Lime will – will show some benefits a lot quicker because it's going to release a lot sooner. Um, so that's always an option as well if, if you need to uh, get some benefits now, but you're also going to look down the road, maybe do some ag lime and some pell lime. So. And it's going to make a difference too whether you're doing conventional tillage or you're doing no-till, no-till um, as far as how fast it's going to um, take effect, incorporate, and, and change the pH in the soil. But um, you know, So I think we've touched on the fact that regardless of, of what you have for equipment – you can get the fertilizer, you can get the lime on, and you can get that's your 
that's your first step is your, your first couple steps there is getting your site prep um you know planning figuring it out getting your right right uh, fertilizer and lime there um the other thing too is i th i think to consider when we're talking about the might call it some of the planning side of it too but um take into consideration what your site is currently if you're looking to t convert it into a plot so if it is a uh reed canary grass or you know it's a uh, fallow field uh well, old growth pasture um or if it's an ag field if it's an ag field that's been in production like what you had done mike um it's a whole lot less work yeah um just because you're able to get the, the key in all this is getting seed to soil contact you get seed to soil contact increased germination now you've got your food growing um in in you know weed um what am i trying to say here um well you're gonna the, have weeds wait the, yeah but your weed competition yes um so if like this time of the year uh you know if you're going into a you know, maybe what was a brassica plot or a bean plot, you want it to be clover, you can go in and frost seed your clover on top of it, you're probably going to be pretty good on it. Um, that's the right time of the year to be doing this right. sort of stuff. Um, Not May 15th like I did last year. I mean, you fought weeds. I fought weeds. You fought a weeds lot, and fought weeds. All the way through the end of July until we finally got some rain. And, you know, so, yeah. And I, I guess I should have. But the problem that I ran into last year is I was waiting on CRP boundaries to get set and, you know, other things were holding up the train. So I couldn't just go out and do what I wanted to do. So I had to make the best of it. Um, but, yeah, if you at all possible, you know, you want uh, a perennial grass or any type of warm season planting, you know, you can go in and, and frost seed it now, especially your clovers. So if you've got if you're let's just for an example purpose here, let's say you're wanting to do a brassica plot uh, that you're looking to get seeded, you know, we'll call it end of July to mid late August at the latest. Um, so early in the year you have decided that, uh, that's what you want to do. Um, you need to get kind of a clean slate as far as your soil. Um, you know, a lot of people have the idea that they need to go out and they need to work the soil as deep as they can work it and, and get it fluffy and all those sorts of things. That is not necessarily the case. Um, if you're doing a poor man plot and you've got access to a rake, um, a, a backpack sprayer, um, you know, and a leaf blower, things like that, you can get rid of the residue on top. So if you went out, uh, you know, if you want to burn it this time of the year, when everything is dead, you can burn it off. That's going to get rid of the residue. Then you can go back in the, in the springtime when things start to green up with your backpack sprayer and spray it. Keep it dead. Um, and then come planting time as long as it's been dead you don't have the residue there and all the green and the weeds and this and that uh if you go in and you literally scratch the surface of the dirt a little bit you've put your fertilizer on you put your lime on you can go in and seed put your seed down um you don't have to go in and work the soil deep no. um you can literally just if you had access to a harrow uh or a hand rake um I you know and these these harrows i mean i was just telling you before we got on the air is right off my yard here i've got a uh, eastern red cedar that's grown up and it grew up through a spike tooth harrow you know it's just a little three or four foot spike tooth harrow that's growing up out there i mean so some, a lot of people use at some point i'm gonna cut that tree down and reclaim that spike tooth harrow it looks in great shape i mean it's just uh, uh so stuff like that is out there you know and another thing too is, is you don't have to go out and buy all brand new equipment no. Um, so we're lucky that, you know, Sullivan Auctioneers is just what, four miles or so from here. And they have a couple annual consignment auctions and stuff like that. So, you know, I have a disc that, uh, I bought from a buddy of mine, but he actually bought it from a consignment auction. I think I gave him $200 for it. Uh, I, my three point spreader, it come from there. It was used. Your dad actually was there and bought it for me. But, uh, I think I, you know, paid half price of what full, you know, new price was for it. Um, you know, my Colta Packer, it come from an auction. I bought it from a guy that bought it at an auction, but you know, it's old. Um, you know, so you don't have to go out and buy brand new equipment all the time. So, uh, that's something to keep in mind as well that. Yeah. And a lot of it, I mean, you know, look at your budget too. I mean, if you have an ATV, you can buy attachments for ATVs that will work. They are cashy though, is the only thing. You can buy used stuff. You can go buy a little, uh, uh, you can buy a little pole type fertilizer spreader for yep. not much. Uh, pick up a harrow. Um, you know, there's some other stuff out there, other attachments that are going to be cashier. But if you're doing a low budget, you know, not wanting to spend a lot of money on equipment, you know, I would tell you is buy a harrow. 
Right. You can take those tees, stand it up, run around that thing four or five times. You've got loose soil everywhere. Yep. Um, enough that you, after that you can go out and spread your brassicas and pretty well walk away from it. You know, you don't have soil that's worked deep. It's that top quarter inch that what you've tore up. Let that in, you know, that seed gets down in there, a little, you know, soft rain on it, and it's going to be, you know, germinated in no time. Yeah, or if you have some sort of lawn roller or cultipacker or something, you can run right over top of that if you need to. But the best thing to do is try to plan your seed spreading around a rain. And I tried that last year, like 100% chance it's right across, you know, it's 20 miles away, storm's coming. <laughs> Weatherman's never right. And I get out off off work, get changed, get out there and just bust my tail and think, oh, man, I just beat the rain. And literally not a single drop of rain would come. So one other time, I, it was actually raining, and I'm out there in the rain doing it because at least you know what's going to rain then. But you want to try to plant it as best you can around the rain. Um, but I had some seed that sat out there for three or four weeks before it got any good rain, and it it did fine. I mean, the turkeys found a lot of it, and they ate some of it up. But um, I thought it was it was a lost cause. You know, nothing's germinating, nothing's coming up, um, and was getting a little disappointed. And I would talk to the guys from Whitetail Institute again, their customer service was phenomenal for me. Uh, I called them three or four times probably, just telling them what my situation was, what I'm seeing, what they think, if this is something that is plausible or if you know I needed to try something else. Um, very good uh, resource there. Always happy to talk to you. Um, but all it took for mine was get some rain. You know, Once you get some rain, it's a hardy, coming. Yeah, and, if you've got a brassica seed, it's a pretty hardy seed. I mean, it's a hard, um, you know, it's just going to sit there and wait on the rain, wait yeah. on uh, the right moisture to germinate. and. Um, you know, so, I mean, you can – and that was, I guess, best-case scenario there was that you're able to burn it off in the springtime, spray it once or twice, be done with it, very, very minimal work. I mean, you've got – depending on the size of your plot, if you need a quarter-acre plot, you've probably got a few hours wrapped up into it. You know, call it a day by the time you – you know, you seeded it, put the fertilizer lime on it. Um, and you can also – if, you, if you're if you planning on a, you know, a, a cool season planning for, you know, your brassicas or something that you're going to plant end of summer – uh, you can go in this time of year, clear it all off, and then just plant your yourself a, an annual clover, some sort of crimson clover, red clover, mm -hmm. and get that to grow. And then that way you're providing food at least, um, and you hope that maybe it takes off enough that uh, when it does come time to uh, get your brassicas in there that you know you don't have a, a bunch of weeds and um, more work for yourself necessarily. Um, and, and again, you're providing food for turkeys and birds and butterflies and bees and deer and whatever else, even if it's just a, a two tenths of an acre, a little plot, um, that's always an option as well to, to plant something, some sort of, you know, warm season annual and put that in there until you come in in the fall. And again, clover is just as easy to, to plant. I mean, get, get a little bit of soil tore up and then what, what I've had good luck of doing, uh, you know, if your ultimate, your your end goal is a clover plot um, and your site is not prepared for a, or not feasible to have a, a frost seeding on it, is when I've planted my brassicas, I've also put the clover seed in there as well. It will germinate. Um, I've had a lot better luck doing a fall seeding on clover than I have a spring seeding. And I did that in the small field. Um, this year, I went ahead and put a full rate of the Whitetail Institute Imperial Whitetail Clover in with those brassicas uh, because my original plan was to just make that a clover plot. And some of that may be changing a little bit again from seeing a fall of having it there and learning and, you know, tweaking things as we go. But it's got that in there. And it started, you started to see some clover coming up. Now we had a, a pretty wet fall, you know, so it had that clover had a chance to kind of get established and there was so darn much brassicas and oats and stuff in there that, um, you know, I didn't have to worry about the deer or anything eating it. So I'm curious to see these next couple months uh, when springtime hits and, you know, the sun's out longer and it warms up just to see what kind of stand we have with this clover um, in a fall planting instead of, uh, you know, I think you'd spring. be surprised as far as how good the clover does turn out. Yeah. Uh, that's the same thing I did in Missouri because ultimately I wanted a clover plot behind, you know, I had oats and uh, oats and brassicas and I put the clover in with it. The clover last year down there, I mean, you could see it come up good. Um, so I'm going to frosty a little more into it because I know there's probably some spots that I missed or yep. this or that, but um, you know, I, I, my thought is, is by 1st of May, I should probably have a pretty lush carpet of clover in there um and when you do that then you have less weed competition and you know uh, and the weeds i think some people underestimate just how bad those can be and you know i kind of made a little bit of a mistake last year is when we decided to take 
all of my tillable out of commercial and put it into the CRP and the food plots, I went through and tilled everything, took a tiller. And, and I like to use no-till, but I wanted a fresh start. Uh, we had corn residue and all sorts of stuff out there. So for right or wrong, I, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't sure if I should do it or not, but I did it anyhow. Uh, it looked fantastic when it was done. had a nice, perfect seed base. But what I didn't think of is that – that ground had been no-tilled for a long time. The, the, the and the, seed, the wheat bank seed that wheat. was in there was unbelievable between the um, the mare's tail and the uh, Cerecia lespediza or whatever it is. Um, you know, it come on and it come on with a fury. And I fought it in my beans. Um, I fought it in uh, in the the clover everywhere. I mean, it was, it was bad and, and it got dry. And so I just had to start going out and mowing and wait for rain. And eventually, I mean, the clover did take off and looked phenomenal, but, uh, in theory, looking back, I probably should have just, uh, done something more of a no-till application and kept those seed banks down. But I'm hoping now where the clover is established that those weeds won't have a chance to be as bad as they were. I'm going to have a little bit, I'm sure that I'll have to take care of, but not yeah, as your grasses start to grow in the springtime, I mean, you can do some herbicide treatment with their, uh, you know, clothodim or something like that. Um, there's some other... Um, 2,4-DB. Yeah, uh, there's a combination out there, uh, IMOX. IMOX, yeah. Uh, that's a good one I think a lot of people are using. It's not cheap. It's, I mean, it's cashy, but it's, it's a, a one-pass one application, you know, to... Yeah, clover I mean, safe, but get rid of your broad leaves and your gra grasses. Even your clethodim, you can go in. You know, when your brassicas, if you're just a straight brassica plot, you can spray clethodim on there. If you have grasses coming in, yep. uh, you know, for comp weed competition, um, and it will take. I did that on a plot last last fall. You know, I had the grass was had a bunch of grass up in it that was probably three inches tall, and I had the uh, the brassicas coming in. I thought, man, I'm gonna go back and spray it, and man, it just it killed the grass and let the brassicas uh, grow, grow good, but. Um, so that was something else that, you know, last year that I, it was a new learning experience for me was, you know, herbicide treatments, the when, the where, and the what, and the how, and, and all of that. Um, what I've learned is, is spray them early, spray them at three or four inches instead of three or four feet. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, but I didn't have a sprayer at the time. And, you know, I was just behind the eight ball on everything. Now, now that I have a year of experience under my belt, I'll be able to stay ahead of things. And again, everything worked out great, but Man, it was it was a rough year, um, but you know I got me a, a forty gallon PTO uh, electric sprayer, um, and then just kind of started learning how to calibrate it and um, you know figure out what uh, how many gallons per acre you know ounces per acre of stuff and how many gallons per acre I was spraying and you know your surfactants and um, all of that stuff. It's all out there, and there's it's so it's so hard to. Um, tell somebody yeah this is what you need to do I mean, because there's so many variables of what is it that you're fighting what is it that you have planted you know because you got to make sure whatever it is your spring is going to kill the undesirables but it ain't going to harm the the stuff you've planted in there and you know so whether it be a broadleaf or a grass depending on you know corn is a grass and you know um your broad leaves are you know like your soybeans or i think that they'd be a broad leaf um of course, most of your soybeans are... Uh, You're telling a story here, Mike. Yeah, I am. <laughs> most of your soybeans are Roundup ready uh, anyways. But yeah, so you just got to know what you've got in the ground and what it is that you're spraying. Um, but that information is out there, um, and you just got to kind of... If you don't know what to spray, uh, some of these chemical... Uh, uh, sales companies, you can find them online, call them. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the one? There's one out east. Um, I'm trying to think of it. Um, I bought some stuff off of there, but I can't remember the name of it. Oh, right the now. the company online. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll think of it. They sell all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different chemicals and um, stuff like that. And at the same time, if you don't know what to spray, call your local co-op. Yeah. They're, they 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 know this stuff. They do it day in and day out. So, um, Keystone Pest Solutions. That Keystone. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. And a lot of people buy stuff from there, but. Um, so, you know, I, I talked about the, the preparation of knowing that early on this time of the year that you know, you know, before spring on what you're wanting to do for a plot and ways to get that site prep for seeding when you want it. Uh, good idea that you can put a, you know, put a crimson clover in there because that crimson clover is going to come up. It's going to grow. It's going to uh, put a seed head on. Then it's going to die. Right. Um, then it's going to give you an opportunity to seed back in what you want. Um, if you could no-till into that crimson clover would be the most ideal situation to be able to come in and, 
and uh, do something. I know a lot of people have done, uh, if they've done Crimson Clover, uh, they'll wait till later planting dates for beans mm-hmm. and then go in and drill their beans into the Crimson Clover. By that time, their clover has died. The beans have come up. Um, and then when you've got, uh, you know, your beans are going, uh, turning, the leaves are falling off, your Crimson Clover has reseeded itself back. And now you've got this little carpet of green clover yeah. underneath of it as well. But, and that's um, something we'll, we'll get into on you know our advanced episode, too, talking about cover crops and stuff like that into beans and um, trying to have something growing year-round. Um, you know, that's getting to be a little bit more advanced. I mean, we kind of wanted to focus on, you know, here. Just some a of these simple – th- uh, this episode's kind of a simple – you know, they, this is kind of the basic, and, and I'm kind of approaching this from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, trying to make sure everybody knows that regardless of what you have for equipment, if it's as little as a backpack sprayer or a hand sprayer and, you know, a rake and things like that, that you can still have quality food plots. It's, it's the same steps, um, just on a much smaller scale than maybe if you've got the mechanical equipment. But if if you're looking at, you know, you, you decide, well, man, maybe you picked up a lease or bought a new property, um, and it's first of June, middle of June, and you're deciding what you want to do for a plot. Uh, by that time, uh, and I'm going to use an example of a farm that a guy bought last year, and uh, he'd come to me and said, "Hey, how about a plot here?" And you know, at that point, it was it was mid July, and I was dealing with what was pasture ground that hadn't been mowed, hadn't been, uh, you know, it had been basically very few cows on it for a lot of years. So probably the last 20 years have been pasture. So I had a lot of thatch there to deal with I wasn't going to just go spray it and throw seed out and and probably have great luck so what I ended up doing was I sprayed it I gave it about two weeks uh, and I sprayed it plenty hot um, knowing time of the year uh, you know you're a lot of times in your springtime when the plants are growing fast they're going to absorb um, you know absorb the chemical quickly so I sprayed it a little hot went back in two weeks and then I burn it mm-hmm. um, it still had a little moisture left in the grass because I had quite the, quite the uh, smoke plume going up. Oh yeah. When I got in the air was heavy that night. When I got done, I decided I probably should have called the sheriff's office and let them know what always, I was doing. Always, always call your local sheriff's officer, dispatch center, fire department. Let them know you're going to do a control burn because the last thing you want, and like our county, we have an ordinance that if you don't call it in and they get called out, you're getting charged. Yeah. So. Um, Always, always <laughs> call your... It was too late by that point. Yeah. It was about a 15-minute burn. But it, what I did was I, I was able to take all that thatch on top and get rid of it. And then I was able to go in and lightly work the soil. Uh, you know, I still had some clumps here and there because it wasn't completely dead, but it was a hot enough fire that it just scorched everything yeah. off of it. Um, and we went in, and, or I should say I went in. Um, we did the fertilizer, um, you know, in... in put the seed on top so i was able to and i had mechanical stuff there too but if right. this had been a smaller plot uh you know this was probably a two acre plot what this was but i could have done all of this uh by myself with a backpack sprayer a hand sprayer uh, i could have burned it if i had a, a leaf blower just to make sure i kept the you know the fire under control and then go in and you know if you've got a you know a hand rake scratch the soil a little bit or go in and uh you know with a harrow or something behind a foiler but it, it's just evaluate the situation is what I would tell people um, and plan ahead if at all possible. Yeah, it, the planning, it just can't be stated enough that um, you want to have a good game plan going into this because uh, otherwise, for one, you're not going to be working efficiently. I mean, you're going to um, do more work than what's necessary. Um, just execute a good plan and you're going to see better results that's for sure and again not just plan for this year but plan for two three four years down the road of what your goals are and what you need to do to get to those goals so um but i just i don't want anyone to feel that you know they can't plan a food plot i literally last spring i had never grown as much as a tomato plant and i get this wild harebrained idea that i'm going to put in five acres of food plots and uh you know and there was some learning experiences i tried doing a um, a broadcasting of soybeans, and uh, I think I had some bad beans, um, but I also dumped like uh, two acres worth of beans in about a half acre span because I had the settings wrong on my spreader, and it was just a rodeo. It didn't work good, um, so I had to come back in later and you know replant them. Um, but don't be scared to fail. But if you do fail, learn your lesson. And if you failed, even after doing preparation, that's fine. Um, but I think if you fail just because you didn't prepare at all, um, 
that's something you want to you want to try to avoid so um but that's kind of just a a basic intro i mean i literally think we could sit here and talk for hours upon hours about food plots i mean i'm sure it'd be a lot of rambling um i love them uh i love the the challenge of them i love the uh, idea of the benefits that they can bring to your farm, not only for your deer, but your turkeys. I mean, uh, the turkeys on my place have just been annihilating everything out there, but they've got green stuff growing and they were eating the beans and, um, you know, just, uh, it, it's great for everything. And to me, um, it was nice when I, it was commercial production cause I did nothing, you know, I just got a check once a year. Uh, now I've got to go out and do the work, but as we talked in last week's episode, I want to try to maximize my farm as much as I can to get as much use out of it, um, which is return of my investment for me because it's something else I can do. And now to take my son out, he went out with me uh, last summer, hot, probably too hot, uh, to help me plant some of these brassicas. And, um, you know, I kept telling him, hey, you can go home, and he didn't want to. He wanted to plant that deer food. And then we went out this spring, and into the plot, he helped me plant. I even let him plant a couple rows, put that – shoulder spreader over his shoulder and it was way too long so i kind of had to hold it but he he planted a couple rows and then we go out and we find a shed in it this year and um you know so some of these food plots we've got to hunt over and i want him to learn too that you know we put this work in um but it's going to make the land better it's going to make you know all the animals around us better it's just you know it, it's a good thing but it's also fun i mean it's work but you got to enjoy it um yeah and i just wanted to start with the basics on this it's just you know, I, I want everybody to know that, hey, regardless, a lot of ways I, to do I'm, this. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I've done food plots this year with, you know, going out and scratching things out a little bit to, you know, a forty horse tractor to a hundred and forty horse tractor. Yep. So there, there's different ways, and and uh, I think in the next episode we can touch on, uh, you know, some other techniques or things that I found that worked or other options to consider. Yeah. When you do and don't have equipment. Um, you know, and let's just get into that, I think, a later episode. and Planning methods. I mean, you know, yeah, there's no-till drills and, you know, planters and broadcast stuff. And um, I just hope this gets everybody to, you know, realize that regardless of what they have, um, if you want to do a food plot, um, you know, it, it is feasible to do. Um, and, and also and understand that to some people, maybe it's not economically feasible. You are going to spend some money. I mean, we're not going to deny that. If you're going to do this right, you're going to spend money and fertilizer and uh, seed and herbicide and time. And, you know, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take some work and some attention. But, you know, it to me, without a doubt, it is well worth it. I mean, the the end definitely justifies the means for sure. Yeah, and I'd have to do the math, but I'm just going to take a stab that if you wanted to do a, a quarter acre food plot, um and do the poor man plot that a well, hundred bucks get you all the way. I, I was going to say you, you go get, you go get the seed, a little bit of fertilizer, a little bit of line. You might have 150 bucks in it, man. I don't, I, I don't think so. I don't I think I really you probably don't. would not for a quarter acre. And you could probably even go get you a, uh, an earthway over the shoulder spreader for that hundred bucks. I mean, I really think you'd be surprised that for a quarter acre, how far that would take you, you know, maybe you're going to spend 30, $30 on seed, uh, $30 on fertilizer, um lime is cheap lime, it's like ten dollars yeah ton or it's, it's less so than that. cheap um but. so yeah, it can be done um and sometimes you just have to start somewhere you don't have to just dive in head first i would have never di- dove in as deep as i did with this project if i didn't know that i had guys like tyler and you know some of my friends that are farmers that have offered some advice or some equipment or whatever it may be um, but there was a time that i was planning on just using an atv and those implements and did a lot of research on what was out there and what it would take and um but uh i just i i waited before i implemented anything and then i decided to um, continue driving my 16 year old truck and went and bought a used tractor instead so um, if i didn't go about go out and buy that tractor i'd probably be driving a newer truck but to me the 16 year old truck still runs still does what i needed to do and um, yellow hornet got a tractor yeah the yellow hornet so <laughs> um yeah so it took, again that was just how i prioritize things and i know everybody's in different situations in their life financially or whatever um but uh it can be done, you know. When there's a will, there's a way. The old the old adage there is is very true. So, 
Um, hopefully, you know, maybe somebody learned a little something or maybe you've gotten motivated just enough to, to go out and try something, even if it isn't a quarter acre, you know, go out and do a tenth of an acre, do 20 foot by 100 foot or something, you know, um, just see what you can do, see what you can get to grow. Um, I think if a guy goes out and puts a little food pot in and uh, puts a trail camera on it, and even if he doesn't hunt it, but he puts a trail camera on it and sees that the deer are utilizing uh, his work, yep. I think that to me that's gratifying and satisfaction there of saying, hey, okay, this is worth it. Uh, you know, you're benefiting your property, you're benefiting the wildlife. There's more than just deer that are going to, you know, come through and eat on that kind of stuff. The turkeys are going to pick through it. The rabbits and squirrels and coons and possums yeah, I mean, and bees and birds go. and everything. I mean, it's unbelievable how diverse that 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 can happen. I mean, so. I watched the squirrels out here when the snow was on. They're going out and you know going out to the bean plants and picking the pods off. I yeah. mean, literally, I watched a squirrel go out and do that. And I'm scratching my head, kind of like well, I've never seen a squirrel do that, but. You know, it, it benefits much more than just deer. Um, you know, it, it benefits all wildlife. So, um, you know, that may determine what you want to plant in your plot too. Just, you know, and I just talked about brassicas, but that's a simple one to do. But right. if there's other, you know, maybe it's sunflowers or, you know, oats. Just or, different or, mixtures Yeah, just or different, whatever, different yeah. type of stuff for, for a variety of wildlife. Uh, maybe you want to blend. I mean, that's. You know, all that's good. And diversity is always a good thing, too, in case you have a failure on a certain seed that, you know, you still have something something left. But um, And just when you think you got, uh, you know, pay attention to the seeding rate, too. Right. Uh, I've been guilty of that many, many times of, of planting brassicas, of I go put on what it's supposed to do, what you're supposed to put on, and I get done. I just think, man, I just don't think that was quite enough. And I go back and put a little more on, and then yeah. when they come up, they're all small. And, yeah. you know, so lesson learned, I've just said, okay, do what you're supposed to do. You may feel like it's not enough, but then it, it will come out correct. So, um, you know, I think that's some good information to start on. I think uh, next episode we'll we'll dive in more and get a little deeper on this. Hopefully we can get Louie here and get some of his uh, thoughts and opinions too as to what uh, what he's had good luck with or hasn't had good luck with too. So, And I think if I had one concluder for this episode, it would be to give yourself a chance um, when I got into mine, I said, we're going to do this for five years. I'm going to give it five years and see what happens because I knew there would be some, you know, some success, some failures, some learning, you know, curve. Um, I had such a great year, year one, I'm hooked now, uh, just seeing what the, the benefits can be, um, to the whole ecosystem that, uh, I don't have any plans on getting out of it at this point, but if I would have had a failure, I wouldn't have quit. I would have kept on going. And, you know, tried to uh, try it again next year, you know, until you can figure it out. And then, you know, give yourself five years. And if it's just still not working out or you're not getting the benefits from it that you had hoped and don't feel that uh, the work is worth it, you know, maybe, you know, you, you give it up at that point. But give yourself a fair chance to, to succeed. And I guarantee it, you'll see the benefits and, you know, your property will be uh, much, much better for your efforts. Yeah, and if I had to conclude on one thing, Mike, as I would say for anybody doing this out there, is keep a record book of what you're doing, what you did, what, uh, you know, you did the soil sample, just write down everything you did, how much fertilizer, how much lime, what seed, how many pounds, when you planted it. Settings of your equipment. Settings of your equipment. I mean, maybe even such a thing as far as, you know, if you seeded it on August 15th and it didn't rain until September 20th, you know, I mean, note that in, yeah. in, in your notes there of maybe that's why something didn't work or this or that. or uh, And that's something that I didn't do. And, you know, as we were talking off the air, you know, when you and I went in and, and broadcast all of those cover crops by hand. Um, I don't remember what we seeded. Three or 400 pounds of them. And we finally found the right setting where it was working good. I couldn't tell you what it was. <laughs> Um, so we should have wrote it down and I take a lot of pictures of stuff so I can go back and look and see what days I planted and all that stuff. But I, I do, I need to get me a log and they make like nice leather bound hunting journals that I think you could use just as well for your food plots in the off season. So, um, that's good advice. That's advice that I think we need to take ourselves, uh, cause we haven't really been the best about doing that, but it is good to have a record to go back on to reference. So, yeah. um, so, yeah, this is just uh, the first part uh, of a multi-part episode um, of Food Plots. I don't know if we'll have that uh, more of it next week. Uh, I'm not sure. I think uh, our good friend Ryan Kirby is going to be back in the area here coming up soon. 
and uh, we're hoping maybe we can get him on and see what uh, is going on in his world. And uh, he's got some new exciting stuff uh, coming out with Nomad Outdoors and um, some apparel lines in there. So we would like to uh, maybe get him on, but uh, no guarantees on that. So we will, again, this off season we will touch more on food plots. We'll have more of a, an advanced uh uh, advanced episode talking about uh, maybe bigger plots and uh, cover crops and, and stuff like that. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Maybe you learned something. If there's something uh, that we didn't touch on or maybe you're confused about or have questions on, please let us know. Reach out to us uh, on our website, DeerLandPodcast.com. We can also be found on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Deerland Podcast. So uh, we appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next time.